we see central banks in Singapore, India, Turkey, Poland, they're all adding gold to their balance sheet and diversifying away from different currencies. And as I said, this kind of BRICS plus group of investors, which seems to be growing every year, they're very focused on diversifying away from the US dollar. They're settling more and more transactions of commodities amongst themselves with local currencies. They're really trying to weaken the dollar because the US dollar really puts a stranglehold on them and their economic growth. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter, CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, your host for this conversation. Really looking forward to this one because this conversation is going to be focused a lot on commodities. We're going to talk gold, silver, uranium, and also copper. Really looking forward to it because I'm joined by Sprott ETF or Sprott Inc. Uh, managing Partner and uh, Sprott Asset Management CEO, John Giampaglia. Really looking forward to this discussion. Before I switch over to my guest, hit that like and subscribe button. It helps us out tremendously bringing guests like John on and uh, your support is greatly appreciated. Now, without much further ado, let me bring my guest on. John, it is a great pleasure to have you on the podcast for the first time. Yeah, great to be on. Yeah, looking forward to catching up and uh, we've reached out to originally to, to learn more about your copper ETF and uh, we're, we're going to get to that part of the conversation because I think it's a really interesting one. But uh, to, to test where your mind is at and uh, how you see sort of see things right now, I, I'm going to ask you like our bit of a standard question, but like, how do you currently rate the state of the economy and where do you see things going, John? Well, obviously, every every region is, is, is doing something a little different, but I would say the broad macro um, story is still high interest rates. You know, we've been dealing with high interest rates now, high in a relative basis, but higher interest rates for the last two and a bit years, and it's definitely had an impact on a number of interest-sensitive sectors like the housing market, which has obviously been a big driver of economic growth over the last few years for many places, including Canada and the United States. So I, I describe it as very tepid right now. I mean, people seem to be up waiting on the sidelines for, for rates to come down. Uh, we thought rates were going to come down sooner. The inflation situation has been more more persistent and sticky than, than central bankers were hoping. And I think, you know, we're, we're kind of in this we're kind of in this zone where uh, people are waiting for rates to come down uh, before they start making, you know, larger uh, decisions with investments and and purchasing assets and whatnot. So I think it's it's a real mixed bag and, and interest rates have really been the culprit holding it back. Yeah, it, it is a mixed bag because uh, every narrative actually has the statistics to back it up, which is highly confusing because if you're bullish, there's a statistic to back up that case. But if you're bearish, I'm sure you'll find a statistic like maybe a weaker labor market and uh, the forehandle on the jobs report, right? So I'm curious, like, like how, how bullish are you? It's like It sounds like you're actually a bit negative on the markets. I'm curious, like how, how do you see the rest of the year playing out there, John? Well, I think the, the Federal Reserve in particular has really had the, the markets kind of hostage for two plus years. There is... I think six trillion U.S. dollars and sitting in U.S. money market funds alone, and so all that money is just kind of sitting there, collecting, you know, a, a, obviously a higher interest rate than than those savers have been able to generate with their fixed income investors for the last few years. But we would argue there's still a chunk of that money that's kind of hiding and waiting for for clearer signals in terms of what is the direction of inflation. Um, is it finally under control? Are we going to see a more supportive interest rate environment? Um, and so I do think it's it's had a disproportionate impact on investor psychology. Now, remember, equity markets are forward, uh, you know, forward thinking and forward voting in terms of of stock prices and valuations. And they're obviously ahead of the Fed, so to speak, in terms of anticipating, uh, you know, softer uh, monetary policy in the coming months. So stocks obviously have been buoyant, but as we know, it's been a very different market in terms of a select group of, of technology driven stocks, which have really dry, driven the lion's share of the overall returns and many, many companies that have really lagged. And why? Because they don't have the same growth uh, profile. They tend to be more interest rate sensitive. Um, and they've been, you know, either flat or down. So it's been, it's been a bit of a deceiving market in terms of 
of, of you know, the breadth of the, of, the, of the strength that we've seen across some of these bellwether uh, benchmarks. What's Sprott's case? Like, uh, how are you operating? Like, what what are you expecting? Are you like calculating with one interest rate cut, maybe two, three? Are you even calculating with a hike? So I'm curious. Like, what what is your basis for making investment decisions these days? Yeah, well, we think that central banks around the world um, are in the process of cutting interest rates. Um, we've seen a few first moves. We think there are more to come. And the reason for that is quite simple. The, the, the debt loads that some of these countries are carrying are so significant that the interest rate payments are becoming incredibly challenging to service. If you think about um, the mortgage market, for example, interest rates are very high. Now, if you were lucky enough to lock in your rate a few years ago before we had the big move, you know, you're fine for the next for the foreseeable future. But if you have a mortgage coming due in the next one or two years, you're going to have a very different experience. Um, and in Canada, where I live, obviously, the norm is is generally not to have mortgages locked in past five years. So the last data I read was something like half the mortgages are coming due for renewal in the next two years. And they're not going to be at two and three or four percent. They're going to be at five or six or seven percent. That's going to take a huge chunk out of discretionary income and spending. Um, obviously, at a time when inflation, inflationary pressures have also weighed down the, the consumer. How does it affect currencies? Because currencies are extremely important. Most of the commodities are priced in U.S. dollars. Like, what, what is your expectation for the U.S. dollar in particular? Maybe the euro. We don't need to talk about the renminbi, I think, but curious about uh, your thesis there. Yeah, well, there's really been two big forces at work. One is king dollar um, continuing its reign. Um, and then on the flip side, you've got kind of this group, growing group of BRIC countries that want to dethrone King Dollar, and they want more transactions settled in other currencies that are non-dollar uh, based. And th this is really, I think, part of a larger, we like to think of it as a deglobalization trend or a de-dollarization trend. And obviously, which country is at the forefront of this trend is China. If you think about China, over the years, they've, they've built up hundreds of billions of dollars of U.S. dollars, which they've cycled into U.S. treasuries on the back of, of huge trade surpluses. In the last few years, China has been allowing those treasuries to mature, or in some cases, more recently, selling those U.S. treasuries. And what we see them doing is they're recycling those dollars and they're buying physical gold. China is very determined to wean itself off its, uh, its exposure to the U.S. dollar. It wants to hold uh, hard assets, and gold is, is, the, is the preferred one. So what we've seen in the gold market in the last number of months is China, the central bank there, uh, buying ever larger amounts of gold in, in, in its quest to basically diversify away from U.S. treasuries and the U.S. dollar. That's had a huge impact on the price of gold. Now, more recently in the month of May, they sent out a message to the market that they did not actively buy gold in May because the price had run up to all time highs in US dollars. And we see this from China all the time. When a certain commodity gets a little bit lofty, they tend to step away from the market um, and try to, in many cases, talk it down, push the price down because ultimately they want to accumulate more of that asset at lower prices. And, I think China's message a few weeks ago that they didn't buy gold was really just uh, a smokescreen. They are very interested in their accumulation pl pan, uh, plan of gold, and they may have paused for the month, but I think the longer term uh, agenda for them is to buy much more gold. We're going to come back to the gold market. I've got obviously a few more questions about gold, current price of gold and why it's holding up and things like that we're going to talk about. But uh, just to take all my boxes here on the broad economy here, we, we need to talk S&P 500, broad stock market. Um, you, you talked Magnificent Seven. Um, let, let's just, based on your expectations of rate cuts, like how, how do you expect the main markets to behave? Like, um, is the S&P 500 going to keep rallying? We're trading at all time highs right now. Yeah, it's very likely that the markets can go higher, but I think it's fair to say that equity markets have already moved higher in anticipation of these Fed cut rates. Uh, it may not be reflected in the bond market, but um, I think in the equity markets, 
I think there's a lot more exuberance about rate cuts uh, helping propel equities higher. And then obviously with these technology stocks, there's a lot of excitement right now with artificial intelligence and the infrastructure build out that's going to be required. Uh, that is obviously affecting everything from these companies to uh, downstream in terms of uh, electricity, growing electricity consumption expectations, all of the critical minerals related to energy uh, generation, transmission, storage. So there's been there's been a larger halo effect um, around this AI build out. I think a lot of people are thinking it's going to be similar to say the internet build out that we saw 25 years ago. The amount of technology build out and, and hardware and infrastructure, and they see a similar trend playing out. And obviously, it's about data centers, which um, are a large part of the story. The chips involved and all of the different metals and materials that, that are required for, for this emerging technology, which is obviously uh, very exciting and, and, and many countries want to be leaders in this particular new segment. 100%. It is, it is a race. I think it, it comes down to US against China yet again. Uh, really interesting race to follow. One, one last big topic, uh, John, is, is the bond market. I think you sort of hinted at it in a previous answer, but uh, you're expecting yields to drop because people will be chasing returns, I'm assuming. And then, of course, bond uh, returns or, or bond prices to, to skyrocket a little bit. And uh, is, that, is that a correct assumption based on what you've said previously? Yeah, I think it's fair to say that rates are going to go down gradually. I don't think we're going to see any drastic rate cuts, but I think it's going to be a slow and steady drop over the next 18 months. And that obviously is going to help push bond prices uh, higher. But I think the bond market wants to, you know, see the rate cuts as opposed to get ahead of themselves, which they did at the beginning of the year. They anticipated the Federal Reserve cutting rates three times. So far, we've gotten zero. And I think rates are in the kind of show me mode right now in terms of they're not going to guess. They want to actually see it's going to happen before we see bond prices rally and bond yields fall. Yeah, really interesting. I had a guest on the other day and we were talking about just everything is being financed through T-bills, meaning short duration bonds or uh, yeah, investment vehicles. It's not bond They're not bonds, they're bills because they're shorter duration. Really curious how that plays out because it feels like somebody's being thrown under the bus by doing that. It is locking in higher rates that need to be refinanced. So I'm curious how, how that plays out. John, I appreciate you setting the scene. Like we sort of know where your head is at now because now we can talk commodities and to sort of put a big picture around uh, your sort of your thesis. And uh, I think we'll work that work our way through the precious metals and then we'll go to the base metals. Um, you, you hinted at gold. Of course, a lot of central bank buying Asia, China has been the dominant driver. Um, you, you mentioned uh, they sort of stepped away from the market because it got too hot. The, the market reacted, but maybe not as aggressively or violently as, as the Chinese might have hoped for it because the price didn't drop uh, maybe to the 2150 uh, support level that they might have expected. We're still at 2340. So we're trading at a decent level. Like, w What is holding up the gold price right now, John? Yeah, well, I think there's really good support for the gold price. Um, and I think it's because people understand that longer term, China's plan is to continue this accumulation cycle of gold. It's not just the Chinese central bank. We see central banks in Singapore, India, Turkey, Poland, they're all adding gold to their balance sheet and diversifying away from different currencies. And as I said, this kind of BRICS plus group of investors, which seems to be growing every year, they're very focused on diversifying away from the US dollar. They're settling more and more transactions of commodities amongst themselves with local currencies. They're really trying to weaken the dollar because the US dollar really puts a stranglehold on them and their economic growth. So I think that's a trend that will, will continue. We also see very strong gold demand from Chinese retail investors. And this is really because they're going back to a form of wealth preservation and wealth, a store of wealth that they're very uh, accustomed to over a long period of time. And that is phys owning physical gold. And if you think about the investment choices that the average Chinese investor can, can participate in, you have the stock market there, which has basically been sliding for a number of years. You have the real estate market, which I think everyone acknowledges was a bubble and has popped. You can invest, invest in things like Bitcoin. So what is there left to invest in if you're a Chinese investor? Well, they're going back to what they are 
comfort with, which is gold. So whether that's physical gold, gold jewelry, we've seen very steady sales of gold amongst uh, retail investors. And if you think about other investors in the world, uh, if you think about some in emerging markets or, you know, I often think about someone in Turkey or Argentina and their you know, economy had inflation of 100 percent per year and their currencies are devaluing. You can imagine how people that own some physical gold have been able to save their financial security by doing that. So I know, you know, from a from a North American perspective, we've got a slightly different I think perception of gold, but in places around the world where governments aren't as stable, where currencies aren't as stable, where rampant inflation is the norm, physical gold and to a lesser degree silver is is one way that investors have protected their wealth over the, over the decades, centuries. One of the arguments I keep hearing is like, well, gold is not going up, but the U.S. dollar is going down. Um, you know, just very, very simplified thesis. I just looked at the Dixie somewhat flat right so the dollar seems to be like uh, flat it doesn't move too much where does that thesis come from and would you ascribe to it and uh, is that a true statement is the dollar just losing value and uh, gold is staying higher or moving higher it's sort of the other way but uh, the charts don't tell us that just really simplified here yeah no i think gold is kind of marching its own drum it's kind of shrugged off the strength in the u.s dollar it's it's shrugged off uh, higher re real uh, real interest rates over the last couple of years. Uh, and I think it's just fundamental buying demand that's that's driving it, mostly central banks. The interesting thing to us is that even though the U.S. dollar has finally reached an all-time high in U.S. dollars after hitting all-time highs in just about every currency in the world, Western-based investors are largely indifferent about gold's strength that we've seen over the last, say, eight or nine months. Uh, if you look at the gold ETFs collectively that are trading in North America and Europe, um, other than the last month or so, most of them have been in net outflows, meaning they're shrinking in size as investors are redeeming those units for, for cash. So in Western investors have largely been indifferent to the rally, which I think uh, gives us a lot of optimism that if Western investors start to participate in the recent strength that we've seen in precious metals prices, that will help propel us to new highs and another kind of leg in this in this bull market. Is, is gold too expensive for the Western investor? Just no, a perceived? I don't, think, I don't think so at all. Because again, you buy gold as a, a long-term store of wealth. You buy gold as an insurance policy against some kind of a financial calamity that you cannot predict, whether it's a credit crisis, a currency crisis, equity market sell off, some kind of geopolitical risk. That's why you ultimately own gold in your portfolio. It's basically ballast to offset potential risks in other financial assets that you have in your portfolio. Now, has gold become too expensive, so to speak, for some groups of investors in the world? I think the answer is yes. India would be uh, a good example of that. It's obviously a market that traditionally uh, has accumulated a lot of gold because they don't trust their financial system. And we've seen a substitution effect happening in, in India over the last year or so where sales of gold have, have slipped. And what has made up for that have been very strong imports of silver. So we see lots of silver going to India for uh, purchasing by investors as another store of wealth and obviously silver at around $30 an ounce is way below, you know, where it's all time high was uh, or at the end of 2010, which was close to $50 per ounce. So we've seen a lot of substitution and accumulation of silver in places like India. Yeah, it seems to still be lagging behind gold. Like I've just looked at the year on year, year over year performance. Gold is about 22%, which is not bad for a 5,000 year old relic, right? Uh, but, but silver is 32%, which sounds great. On, on paper, but we all know that silver usually outperforms gold three to one. It is lagging behind. C can you explain that a little bit? Like what, what's holding silver back? Is it maybe more of an industrial metal? Yeah. So, you know, silver is kind of a chameleon. It's a hybrid metal. It's got monetary characteristics to it and it has industrial characteristics to it. Um, but on the monetary side, if you think about it, um, what silver has going against it is that central banks don't accumulate silver. It's just too voluminous in terms of, you know, 
how much you have to store relative to the value. And so central banks don't buy silver like they do with gold as part of their foreign, foreign exchange reserves. So that's a negative. Now, what silver has going for it is obviously its role in industrial applications. And the most important application that we've seen in the last few years, particularly in the last 12 months, has been silver's critical role in solar panels. So in every solar panel, there is a small amount of silver paste, which basically excites the electrons and, and makes those solar panels more efficient. And we've seen that globally, the deployment of solar panels is at all time record highs because the technology continues to fall in price and, and countries are building out more and more uh, low carbon sources of energy to power their grids. China alone has added more solar capacity to their grid last year than the rest of the world combined over the last four years. So we don't see that trend going away as, and, and silver is going to represent uh, more and more production going specifically to solar panels. So what we've been telling investors for the last six months or so is that you have to be patient with silver. Gold is going gonna, is gonna to take the lead and break out, which it's ha it has done. And then silver was going to play a catch up trade and kind of slingshot by gold. And that's starting to happen right now. One thing I would uh, would note is that the price of silver has become more volatile over the last couple of months. It's not uncommon for us to see the silver price go up and down a dollar per day, you know, per ounce. Um, and that tells me there's a bit of a tug of war going on right now around silver at $30. It feels like it wants to break higher. And then there are some kind of forces that push it back. But it feels to us like the trend is higher and we think the silver price is way too low uh, when you think about the fundamental demand when you think about how challenging it is to to uh, produce silver uh, many of the pure play silver mines are, are gone and um, silver we think is is, is really going to play a critical role in, in energy transition technologies why do you think there is no follow-through in the precious metals prices it seems like you, they all ran to all like Gold ran to an all-time high. Silver finally broke through thirty dollars, but it didn't really follow through. Silver, in particular, why do you think there was no follow-up buying? Like, what, what is your theory there? Yeah, the other thing about silver, which I forgot to mention, is the difference between institutional ownership and interest in gold versus silver, and it's real. We see we see large numbers of institutions that will own um, our physical gold trust, for example. As a, as a hedge for some kind of risk in their in their portfolios. We don't see the same degree of institutional ownership in silver. And that's not just with our own product, but all the silver ETFs. They just don't view it as a, a hedge because it has that monetary and it has that industrial element. So you don't have that same buying tension uh, on silver like you do with gold from Western institutional investors, as well as the central banks around the world. So we, we attribute that, that difference to the, the different ownership profiles between the two metals. And that is interesting. Yeah, that silver is completely ignored in that regard. Um, I have one last question on the precious metals before we come to the base metals. And I'm um, curious to gauge your reaction to or what is the impact of lower interest rates on the precious metals, uh, sort of putting them together? And uh, how, how much of is uh, uh, maybe one or two cuts already priced in into the price of gold and silver? Yeah, I think the biggest impact, obviously, is the movement of capital. You know, as I meant, I'll go back to my comment. I made about $6 trillion sitting in U.S. money market funds. You know, as rates start to come down, some of that money is going to start to look for new homes. And we would hope some of it finds its way back into the precious metals markets and given the sheer amount of capital sitting in those money market vehicles you know it doesn't take a lot to to kind of splash from from that big bucket into some of these smaller buckets to make a difference so we think that as rates fall more of that capital is going to be mobile looking for better returns you know as rates normalize down to say three percent um, we think there's a good chance that gold and silver are going to get their fair share fair share of that capital. Just to just quick follow up to that one, like how much of a return would investors need to see to make it attractive? Like, w w What is of interest here? Yeah, like I said, I think 
first and foremost, a lot of investors have to think about gold in the context of a long-term store of value or, and or I should say, you know, an insurance policy against some kind of growing risk. And look, it's very hard to predict what these risks are. They could be kind of black swan events. But when everything is kind of moving okay in the world, whether it's, you know, financially or geopolitically, we, we find that the perceived value of that insurance that gold provides is less than when risks are higher or there's more uncertainty or there's, you know, developments in the world that are, are making uh, markets unsettled. And if you think about it, you know, we just haven't had a lot uh, of, of events kind of spooking the markets in the last little bit. So again, I think it's a perception when perception changes around having to protect your portfolio. We think in interest in gold from Western investors in particular will return. Yeah, it's, like, it's a bit puzzling to me, and that's a personal statement here, but that investors, especially in the West, are not aware of what is happening and where we're at on the U.S. debt side, interest rates, and why, why they're so ignorant of precious metals to a degree, despite, yes, I get it, the higher price environment, but it feels like they're ignorant. Well, you know, it's, it's one of those things, it's like not a problem until it becomes a problem, and then by then it's too late. And so you either have to, you know, proactively position your portfolio in case, uh, you know, there is kind of a, a moment when the markets um, shift sentiment or something happens to spook them, it, which is why, you know, it's we advocate to our clients they should think about having a small allocation of gold all the time because, again, it's not about trying to time these risks. Um, you're never going to time them. You're not going to predict them. We all the all the you know the investment professionals and experts obviously have missed many different issues over the last 10, 12 years for sure. So our advice is you know don't try to time it. Just put that ballast in your portfolio. Don't get you know don't get too frustrated because it will it will serve its purpose and it has over the longer term. Yeah, hundred percent. And we're not trying to be doom and gloom here, but a certain real realism probably would help, uh, especially if you're staring at the main markets and you're wondering where this is going. Fantastic, John. G great summary of the precious metals. Let let's talk uh, energy metals. Let's talk copper and uranium. Um, first, of course, I'm curious what your thoughts are on the copper market and the copper price in particular. What what is Gop uh, Dr. Copper telling you these days uh, about the economy and, of course, like what's up with copper? Yeah, so Dr. Copper. So you know that that name was was coined because uh, copper was so uh, important for industrial and and real estate purposes that cop the copper price could kind of give you a prognosis on on the health of the overall economy. I think that role has diminished, and that and the and the reason for that is because copper is uh, is moving away from its traditional industrial roots of real estate and construction and things like that to more, I think, um, new technologies that are very copper intensive. And let's think about solar and wind farms. Let's think about uh, things that are more electric versus based on fossil fuels, whether those are heat pumps, uh, obviously transmission of electricity, electric vehicles, batteries, um, copper is really critical for anything that's moving electrons around. And as the world is focusing on energy transition and energy addition, meaning we need more energy to uh, increase amounts per capita in emerging markets as they become wealthier. And as we move to new technologies and cleaner technologies in the West, copper is really critical across all of these things. So. I've talked to many institutional investors that will say, well, you know, the Chinese real estate market is, is, is really in a, a period of decline. So maybe that's negative for copper, but on the flip side, we're building up record amounts of solar and EV adoption is growing around the world. So that's offsetting the demand. And we think investors should be paying more attention to the newer applications uh, of copper and technology, as well as the growing wealth effect you know, if you think about the millions of families in places like India who are moving up the social food chain, so to speak, in terms of their wealth, well, what do they do as they gain wealth? Well, they buy things that you and I take for granted, like air conditioning, appliances. All of these things are very copper intensive. You know, uh, energy consumption in many parts of the of world are still a fraction of what we enjoy. 
And so as those folks gain wealth, uh, they want to enjoy similar lifestyles and enjoy higher rates of energy consumption and convenience and copper is going to be a big part of that. You know, in the West, I would say what's driving a lot of the copper is more about clean technologies and in particular AI. Uh, AI data centers are very copper intensive and energy intensive because they need to have 24 seven power. And I think a lot of investors are starting to acknowledge that copper is part of the part of the story here. So it's a big established market. We've obviously been mining copper for thousands of years. And on the supply side, what we find is that it's becoming ever more difficult to find really large scale copper deposits because all the easy stuff's been found. And these large copper deposits that we will need in the future will require significant upfront investment to build those mines. And the mining companies have made it pretty clear that they're not going to build these mines and bring new capacity on unless they see a higher copper price for longer. And that's kind of our thesis with respect to copper. It's a demand, it's a growing demand story, but it's also a very tight supply story. Uh, uranium is another uh, energy related uh, metal that we've been very bullish on for three years at Sprott. Uh, the, tr the price of uranium has essentially tripled over that period of time as the world has, I guess, re-rated or revalued or, or recognized again the value of having reliable base load carbon, you know, free power from nuclear uh, energy. Well, we'll get to uranium in a second because I'm really curious what the supply side looks like uh, in, in uranium. But uh, look at, looking at the copper chart, and uh, it, it sort of fits my gut feeling about global econ economic sentiment, if I look at it. And uh, But the recent price explosion in, in copper has puzzled me a bit. And I'm curious, like, how much of it is uh, taking away or is, is copper predicting that there's not going to be a global recession? And how much of it was just a, a short squeeze on the, on the copper uh, supply side? I'm curious what your thoughts are there. Yeah, so in the last 12 months or so, we've had a few supply disruptions in copper. We obviously had the Cobre, Cobre Panama mine in Panama that was closed by the government. That took uh, a little over 1% of global supply out of the market. You've had some other producers signal that they were going to miss their production targets this year. Uh, Cadelco, which is the world's largest copper miner in Chile, which is a state-owned company, uh, their copper production fell 8% last year. So our position is that the copper price was quite buoyant earlier this year on the back of the market realizing how tight it is when you took some of those mines offline and, and some of the mines missed their production targets. And that's because uh, an ever increasing amount of copper is being funneled to these newer technologies like electric vehicles and clean energy technologies and data centers and whatnot that are more than making up for, let's say, lost demand from you know China building more cities or urbanizing or whatever. We also see a lot of reshoring and onshoring happening back in the United States where industries, whether it's semiconductors, electric vehicles, battery plants, solar plants, you know, all of these companies and sectors are starting to build more capacity in the United States. Obviously, they're incentivized through the Inflation Reduction Act. There's all kinds of investment and tax credits and, and the money is moving. And so, you know, those are very energy intensive build outs uh, as we kind of reindustrialize parts of the US. So copper, we, we definitely think is getting a, a, a lift from that, even though the traditional drivers of copper, let's say, you know, in the last cycle, what was it? Well, it was China basically industrializing, China building 30 new cities. Well, that's not happening anymore. But w we still see all these new technologies and industries kind of taking up, you know, the, the demand that, uh, that traditionally has driven a lot of the copper. John, you recently launched a copper investment trust where you buy physical copper. And, uh, you know, I jokingly asked you before hitting the record button, was like, were you responsible for the price spike and uh, dump or buying $100 million worth of uh, physical copper? Did that cause the price spike? But I'm curious, like on a, on a more serious note, like how, how are you sourcing your copper for, for the trust? Yeah, so at Sprott, we actually have four different copper related uh, funds that are listed in, in Canada, the US and parts of Europe. Um, and we've been quite bullish on copper for the last year and a half. That's when we started to launch these different 
vehicles. We really want to have a range of offerings to let investors pick and choose. Do they want to invest in the senior mining companies? Do they want to invest in the junior copper mining companies? Or do they want to invest in the physical you know, copper itself? And, and, and most recently, we, we launched a fund that allows investors to do that on the Toronto Stock Exchange. I guess I would start off by saying the copper market is enormous. It's about 31 million metric tons. That's almost $300 billion uh, US per year of copper primary production and, and scrap. It's a really big market. And so I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's fair to say that any one party can have any kind of influence on that. What we saw a few weeks back was a kind of a short squeeze in the US. There's, there's CME warehouses and there's LME warehouses that are located on Europe and Asia. And what we saw was a dis, dislocation between the price of copper stored at the CME warehouses versus the LME warehouses. Now, why was that happening? Well, production in South America, as I mentioned earlier, is down as well. We've had, a, we've had some challenges with shipping. If you think about the Panama Canal, there's a massive backlog of shipping because of low water levels. If you think about how copper goes from Chile and Peru, which are the two largest producers in the world, up through the US, well, they got to cross through the canal. So we definitely saw a bit of a dislocation in price. It has since eased because those shipments have been delayed. We expect, you know, as, as production picks up and the shipping bottleneck eases that those prices will come back to be more in line. But I think it's fair to say it was it was really driven by a lack of of production getting into those U.S. based warehouses. No, oh, gotcha. Thank you so much for explaining that. I was curious uh, where where the issue was and why we've seen such a massive spike. But still, the copper price has, has held up. Of course, it has come back down. It's uh, more realistic at about four fifty a pound right now. So. Um, also, like you're sort of knowing, it's almost a rhetorical question because I seemingly know the answer to it. But uh, same question as for the precious metals. But what happens if the U.S. starts lowering rates, uh, interest rates? W what do you think the impact is, and has it been priced in yet at all? Um, I, you know, we definitely think it's going to be buoyant um, for many different asset classes. Obviously, real estate, stocks, bonds, um, commodities are all going to benefit from lower interest rates. There's no doubt about it. Um, to what degree? Um, I think it's going to be more of a slow and steady thing. We're not going to, you know, we don't think we're going to have a, a, a spike here because I think they're going to, you know, lower rates on a very prolonged kind of cycle. Um, where I, you know, unless there's some kind of a dislocation or very strong signals that they need to accelerate these these rate cuts, um, I think it's going to be a very gradual 25 basis points at a time kind of program. Yeah, I think we need to talk more about the psychological impacts of a 25 basis point cut than uh, maybe cutting by a percent or so. It probably will feel very similar, though. So I'm curious. Um, uranium is the last topic we quickly need to touch on, John. And uh, we're slowly or quickly running out of time here because it's been a fantastic conversation. But to run, catch us up a bit on the on the uranium market. $85 a pound right now. It's up 54% year over year. So it's fantastic performance. Definitely beaten all the other commodities we've talked about. But uh, what what is driving uranium right now? Like, what, what does the market look like? And uh, where is the supply coming from? Yeah, uranium has been a real standout amongst commodities over the last couple of years. And it's it's really because of a few factors uh, that we think are long term and structural in nature. First of all, we're running a structural supply deficit, which basically means the world needs about 180 million pounds of uranium every year to operate all the existing reactors. Uh, we produce right now out of the ground about 150 million pounds. So we're operating at a 30 plus million pound deficit and that situ and that condition is only going to get worse over the foreseeable future as more and more power stations are going to be operating for longer and china continues to build uh ever more number of nuclear power stations and so if you look at different forecasts going out to 2040 the base case is that annual demand will grow to 250 million in the year 2040 and some have that estimate as high as 300 million or more pounds. Again, I said, we're only going to be producing maybe 150 million this year. So you're talking about a mining sector that has to figure out a way to double production in the coming years when it's largely been starved of capital from 2011 to say 2020, 
as the world was shifting away from nuclear energy because of safety concerns. So now the world is shifting back to nuclear energy. Why? Because it provides very reliable baseload power. And these power stations can operate for upwards to 80 years or more. And so once you build them, they can operate for very long periods of time, providing 365 day, 24 seven power. Uh, and the world wants that. They want clean power. They want reliable power. They want affordable power. And with this shift back to nuclear happening around the world, that is obviously pushing the demand for uranium up. And the market is obviously trying to solve the problem, which is push the price of a commodity higher. You incentivize more production so that you can close that, that supply deficit. And that process is obviously underway. Now, even at $85 that you mentioned, we don't think the price of uranium is at incentive pricing to build new mines. We think it's a very good price for existing producers. It's a good price for previously pro producing mines that are that were on care and maintenance and now are back online. But in terms of building new mines, depending on where you are in the world, we think that incentive price needs to get much higher. And we wouldn't be surprised if the price of uranium you know, eventually gets to 100, 120, even 150 or 160 dollars in the next few years to really solve this problem, which is we need to double production. Where's the sweet spot? Like, where would Sprott start to sell its uranium? Is, is there even a price? Like, wh wh what's your buyout price? And uh, how many pounds do you hold actually in the in your trust right now? Uh, we own a little over 65 million pounds of uranium. We have not sold any of it. We don't plan to. It's a perpetual trust. Our our objective with the vehicle is to allow investors to participate in obviously a commodity that is uh, almost impossible to own directly. Um, and the vehicle has proven to be very popular with institutional investors. We also have a number of related ETFs that trade in the United States that invest in uranium mining companies. These have been very popular funds and have produced very good returns over the last three, four years. Um, and again, these are the companies that are producing uranium, building the next generation of mines, and, and obviously are exploring for more deposits. So these have also been very popular uh, choices for investors that want to get exposed to this thematic. No, no fantastic. I appreciate the overview here of the uranium market as well. Um, get to your head, John. Would, of the four commodities we've discussed, if you were to invest 10 bucks, which one, uh, which one would you pick? Well, that's an unfair question. That's like trying <laughs> to pick your favorite child. And we all know everybody has one. <laughs> well, I can't admit that publicly. <laughs> um, it's a, you know, it's an interesting question. I mean, they all have different roles. You know, obviously gold, as I, I like to call it, the balance in your portfolio, right? It's more of this long-term buy and hold position. You know, silver, I think, is more of the value trade right now because at 30 bucks, you're talking about a metal that is still 20 odd dollars below its all-time high. Um, uranium, we think, even though it has almost tripled in price, still has a lot of upward momentum. It is going to be more volatile for sure. Um, it is very geopolitically charged, to use that pun. But it is a very interesting commodity. And again, copper, I think, is going to be you know more of your slow and steady winner over the long term as as copper uh, becomes more and more important for a lot of these emerging technologies and energy addition as well as energy transition. So we think they all have different roles to play in your portfolio. They are amongst our four uh, favorites. Um, some of the other commodities obviously um, have come off a little bit, mainly you know, related to battery metals. But uh, these ones we think all have very unique, I think, fundamentals underpinning. And it really depends on an investor, what they're trying to achieve with their overall portfolio. But we're constructive on all four right now. John, I hear Canada is looking for a new premier. Uh, you, you, you should apply because you've just perfectly politically correct answered my question there without picking a favorite. So <laughs> no, <laughs> you, you should throw your head in the ring for, for the next election here. No, appreciate it. Thank you so much, John. It was really great insights. And uh, of course, we're not affiliated. We're not marketing. I was just personal curiosity how your products work. I think they're, they're really interesting products. So I appreciate your insights and, uh, of course, over, uh, overview of the overall global economy. Much appreciated. Where, where can we follow more of your work? Where can we follow you in general? Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me. And we would we would uh, suggest you come to our website at sprott.com, S-P-R-O-T-T.com. Go to our education and insight section of the website. We've got 
great research reports and podcasts and webcasts. We really focus on investor education. We think it's really important to empower investors with good, solid, fact-based information. Uh, we've got all kinds of internal experts and external experts that we that we uh, that we add up to our podcasts and uh, have a listen, spend some time, and and have a look at the funds and you know make sure you understand what you're investing in. Fantastic, John. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on. Part two, we'll need to talk a bit more about the mining companies and how they're performing. I, I couldn't find a way to squeeze them in here to, without going go too far down the rabbit holes here. Um, no, really appreciate it. And to everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed this conversation here with John Chiapaglia, and uh, I sure did. It was really interesting to get an overview. Where's their head at? Like, what do their products look like, and uh, how can you invest in those products? Where does he see the most potential? He politically correct answers. It was all of them, of course, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll see uh, how how it plays out. But uh, I think he laid out his thesis, so you can make up your own mind uh, where you're going to put your dollars. But uh, it is an interesting world out there, and uh, you should definitely be prepared. We're an educational channel. We don't give investment advice or anything, but we want to educate. I hope. This was informational for you. If it was, leave a comment, leave a like, subscribe to the channel. It helps us out tremendously. It is much appreciated. And uh, we'll be back with lots more from Soar Financially. <laughs>